Well, let's move on to our next uh, topic, which uh, I guess James brought up last, James uh, Sefton brought up last week, but which has been floating around in the air and Andy and I and Gretchen gave some thought to a couple of years ago. That is uh, differences between NTA and distributional national accounts that uh, Saez and Zuckman at Berkeley and, and Piketty in uh, at Paris have uh, been working on. Uh, the, is, is this an end run around NTA? Have we become obsolete or do we have our own uh, special advantages? Now, uh, James Sefton uh, wrote up um, a page or so, which I think you got in your materials. I don't know whether people had a chance to read it, but I think it's very uh, helpful start for this conversation. Um, and then um, Andy also going back uh, to 2018 when we were uh, uh, applying for some grant funding, which unfortunately didn't come through, uh, Andy prepared a little comparison of NTA and distributional national accounts, which was also circulated. And I think these two things together uh, provide a good basis for discussion. Uh, let me just uh, open it up and see what people might have to say on this topic or questions, or if you haven't read the stuff, uh, you might ask for a little summary or whatever. In fact, Andy's thing, maybe we could get that on a shared screen. Uh, do you have that, Gretchen? I have it. Or Andy, are you there? Can you start? I have it, sure. Yeah, why don't you share your screen on that again? So there is the screen. <clears throat> so I don't know how up to date this is. It's a couple of years old, but uh, as far as I know, it accurately portrays a difference between NTA and distributional national accounts. Um, So, I mean, I think one thing uh, this suggests is that there's a lot of similarity between distributional national accounts and NTA, and that's helpful to us. We could use uh, distributional national accounts maybe to answer some of the questions that were raised earlier about reliability of our estimates. So, uh, Saez and Piketty may have better estimates of income uh, than we do, particularly at the higher ends of the income profile. Uh, so we might be able to use that to improve what we're doing. Uh, of course, the niche for us is that we have age profiles for things. So, and I think as uh, uh, the big point that uh, James Sefton made is that it gives us an opportunity to look at uh, life cycle uh, features of uh, distributional changes. Um, one of the things that has come up in my mind is the question about children. So in the work that Hippolyte presented last week uh, and in the work that Saez uh, <clears throat> and Piketty have done, uh, they just look at adults. And I understand why you just look at adults, but um, it concerns me, you know, I, I would like us to think about child inequality as it affects children. I, I don't think saying what the, you know, the distribution of income or consumption for children is necessarily 
Well, we want to know, but well, I would like to know, you know, to what extent are <clears throat> children living in poverty, are they being born to uh, lower income uh, households? So I think that's something that is uh, very useful that we can explore. Um, the fact that we have consumption, I think, is useful uh, <clears throat> because uh, that's sort of the, to me, that's the kind of, I would rather look at inequality in consumption than inequality in income uh, because it incorporates, as an ultimate measure, because it incorporates the effects of tr public and private transfers, but also the fact that people can call on their savings to fund. Uh, consumption and old age. So anyway, that's a few of the thoughts that I have looking at this uh, comparison. But uh, people may have very different ideas about that. Um, it is it, I saw Robert Gall on earlier. I wonder, uh, Robert, if you had a chance to look at what James uh, Sefton uh, wrote up and whether you have any thoughts on this, uh, the difference between the two systems. Yes, um, I'm here. Uh, if you hear me, I don't know. Um, I, uh, I, I try to, to, to put that picture um, uh, together in, in a different way. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that the difference between <clears throat> uh, PSZ, uh, Piketty, Science, Zuck, uh, Zuckerman, and um, uh, an NTA is um, a cross-section versus life cycle. Uh, they have indicators uh, which include life cycles. So um, in the original Piketty book, there is the, the, the Rastignac uh, indicator, if you remember. Um, um, the ratio of uh, potential bequest to uh, life cycle labor income, the, the, the present value of life cycle labor income. So that's a, that's a life cycle uh, type of, uh, uh, of indicator they use. So I think the major difference is between income and, uh, and age, uh, rather than cross-section versus life cycle. And um, uh, both can be uh, used in cross-sectional analysis, and both can be used in, in uh, life cycle analysis. So um, uh, NTA's ad ad advantage uh, is um, the use of age. And there are issues when um, uh, uh, age plays an important role uh, in the analysis of inequalities. Like um, uh, if you remember uh, Pe Peglin's Gini, uh, which goes back to 1975, and there are corrected versions of that. So um, uh, decomposition of um, uh, inequality indicators uh, to an age component and, uh, and the rest. Uh, so if uh, there is a way, um, honestly, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about that, but if there is a way to show that uh, uh, the rapid increase in inequality since the, uh, the 1980s uh, is due to some changes in age st structure or uh, uh, the age composition of education or something, uh, then, then age uh, could, in principle, add to, to, to the analysis. Uh, and the, uh, the alternative, the other major advantage of uh, uh, of NTA is, uh, is private transfers. We have private transfers and, uh, uh, and uh, they, they don't. So uh, I think these are, these are the, uh, the, the two major advantages of, uh, of NTA uh, and both can in principle be used uh, uh, either in cross-section or in, in life cycle. Robert, do you think you could write up a little short note like James did and circulate it with those thoughts? Yep. Yes, uh, uh, gladly. What I'm yeah. thinking is that for all of us, 
If we're applying for any kind of research funding, um, I think this question is going to come up. Uh, what, uh, what do you, you have to offer that's different than uh, Baez and Zuckman and Piketty are, are doing now? Because they've captured a lot of attention uh, with their work. And, uh, but even in 2018, we were uh, having to uh, make an argument that NTA really had important other things to offer. And so I think it, it can be um, not just helpful, but maybe uh, absolutely necessary to have some material you can draw on if you're writing a proposal or trying to uh, interest a funder in supporting this kind of thing. So I think what James wrote, I'm, I think what if Robert can write up something that'll be helpful, and Andy's table that we have on the screen now, all of that can be uh, very helpful. Anyway, uh, I wonder if other Okay, so should we start? Is everyone back already? Yes, okay. But uh, so it's a pleasure for me to chair the second session. And I think uh, just as a wrap up out of the first session, I think we have, in fact, I think three working groups maybe out of the first session. I think one working group would be great on bootstrapping and investigating, I think, uh, the sampling error or the structural errors. I mean, in this NTA, the second working group would be wonderful uh, to look more closely again at the B-Quests. I mean, possibly not only data-driven, but also from a model's point of view, like Kupulit mentioned. I mean, really going back to the Solov model again. And the third working group, I think, would be wonderful between the NTA and the distribution and national accounts, how they really differ. And uh, by the way, maybe we might even think of inviting sometimes someone from the distributional account society and have a discussion, I think, with them uh, personally. I think this would help us a lot, I guess. So, but now going back to the role of uh, my I think, session, <laughs> I think uh, the idea is now we were talking a lot today and also the last time about micro NTA. And there was the request now by Ivan and also others about how to really use this micro NTA and how to relate them with typically demographic phenomena like mortality outcomes, health uh, disparities. And I'm wondering now if Ivan is yet with us or not. Do you know Gretchen or? Nope, he is not. So. Okay. <laughs> then uh, I'm very happy, I think, because Ron already told me there's someone else in this session who can even share his slides with us. And I'm really happy, Raya, to see you maybe after 10 years or 15 years again, <laughs> now via Zoom. And I think you have something to share with us exactly on this topic which Ivan raised. And I would give the floor now to you. Oh, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to join in again. Uh, this uh, was a project that Ron and I were looking at, I think, four years ago in 2016. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to just use my, my words and my gestures and my lovely face to explain. I don't have any slides, I'm afraid. Uh, so four years ago, we were interested in a topic that had arisen uh, in, in one of these NTA workshops uh, about, I, I think it was maybe motivated by education as being kind of the interesting variable to think about, but looking at the, uh, the distribution of transfers, net transfers across the socioeconomic spectrum, whether it was measured by education ultimately, or income or race or something like that. And so I recall that this came up, um, I think Luis was in the room, Luis or Sarah Bixby for sure, and maybe Ron was presenting something. So what we started to think about was, was what a good uh, study would be for a pilot a project, a pilot proposal with a particular outcome, what we thought of was that uh, if you might imagine a, a particular expansion of, of health insurance coverage uh, might be interesting, uh, both from a perspective of, uh, you know, so this is a, in the United States, a rather special thing, of course, because in other countries, health insurance might be more universally covered, but it was a, a thinking about what the 
expansion to the prescription drug benefit might look like across the different socioeconomic strata, so say by education, uh, what, what sorts of transfers we would see uh, that might be different, and then thus what differences in health outcomes we might, we might also see. Um, was, that, was that fairly clear? It, a lot of words there, and for somebody who maybe isn't familiar with the U.S. situation, it might seem a little strange, but um, the, the politics of it all had been rather interesting over the years. And I we didn't have a prescription drug benefit for older people until uh, 2003 or so, I believe, under George uh, W. Bush. So the, the challenges in doing something like that, of course, are, are that... Uh, the NTA, uh, first of all, wasn't uh, set up by socioeconomic status. It, it was you know, estimated by age and I think by sex. So we had to think about how to do that. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that uh, traditionally health and mortality is not something that gets measured uh, alongside everything else in the NTA. So uh, this you know, is a standard problem in studies. You might need to take your X's from one data set and Y's from another data set. What we decided to do was, was compare uh, age groups and birth cohorts, and we used a different data set. We thought about several, uh, as, and you, of course, would see this in different countries, the context, uh, you might have a different type of uh, health interview survey, but that's one option. And we decided to use the United States Health and Retirement Study to look at the health outcomes. Uh, one of the well, let me just say a few more things, I guess, about that. So you can get started on that, and that's, that's how far we got, and about halfway through the project uh, was to look at the health outcomes on the HRS side and to assess what that was looking like across uh, ages and for different cohorts that were impacted by this policy. And then the hope would be, of course, that we would see uh, the differences in... Uh, the, the new prescription drug benefit than in the transfers on the NTA side by education. In the process though of, of looking through that, uh, I think we discovered that uh, one of the big components of, of this uh, transfer side of things uh, had originally been estimated with underlying data that didn't allow us to easily uh, figure out where uh, the educational differences might be. So uh, we had to back out the uh, some of the Medicare spending based on a data source that wouldn't allow you to figure out, you know, high education versus low education sorts. So um, that, you know, revealed that especially if you're thinking about health and mortality, uh, you, might, <laughs> you, you might need to go and spend more time on the NTA side to, uh, to, to make it so that you could see granularly where the transfers were going. What we saw in the outcomes was a little promising, that in fact it did appear that there was some change uh, pre and post with the Medi Medicare prescription drug out, uh, outlays, uh, but we, we weren't yet able to actually link it up to the NTA and, and, and run a test of that. Um, so that was, that was where things were back in 2016. Um, may, maybe I could just say a few more things about what I, had occurred to me before joining the the conference here about useful topics to pursue, at least in the U.S. context. I, uh, I find that, you know, teaching uh, economic demography at Berkeley, I tend to have a very U.S. focus, uh, focus sort of pitch of it all. And, and, uh, and in my research, I tend to be rather U.S. focused. And I think there are interesting questions to, to ask in different contexts. But I, what I find is that comes most naturally to me. So the, the, the emerging, uh, one of the emerging challenges, of course, before coronavirus was uh, the deaths of despair among white non-Hispanics in the United States around age 50. And it occurred to me that this is another thing that one might be interested to examine through the lens of NTA if it were possible. Um, the, there you would have to probably look at, at race differences, of course, to begin with. Uh, and then ideally uh, educational differences too was the big thing that this is the work by Ann Case and Angus Deaton uh, on the deaths of despair, and it turned out that it, it's you know, the big deal is being age 50 without a high school degree and white, not Hispanic in the United States. And it turns out that those people seem to be dying of, of uh, substance abuse and, and, and suicides and things like that. And so one of the things one might be interested in is, is assessing the degree extent of transfers into that group. Um, K 
Case and Deaton looked at income, and they they found something that seemed to suggest that maybe income was uh, was lower. But then they dug further and found out no, it, it was not a plausible um, descriptor. Um, transfers and uh, it might be part of the story, and I guess uh, I'm there too. I I think the uh, the effort would probably be fruitful in some sense because you'd uh, you'd be able to figure out along the way what was going on in, with some greater uh, granularity, I guess. But you might also find that even among, uh, say, you were able to to decompose by you know race and education, you might not find a ton there because maybe the story is really uh, heterogeneity within that group of of white non-Hispanic with no high school degree. It's possible. Um, I think that's one of the challenges with, with health and mortality outcomes in general is that we suspect a lot of the action is probably along these finely measured layers of inequality. And uh, the NTA gives us a very useful perspective across the age range. Um, and, you know, some of the big questions then are to what extent we've seen differences in, in those policy regimes and perhaps uh, the best and most fertile uh, ground there is actually in, in other countries, not so much in the U.S., where perhaps there have been changes in policies. Let me uh, stop filling the air with, with my words and, and see if I can provide any further uh, clarification on all the stuff I've just said, if, if there's interest. Okay, uh, thanks, Ryan. Many thanks. I think it's a lot of ideas coming up. And uh, I see also Agnieszka, and she's taking care of the chat. Uh, and uh, maybe before I ask Agnetsky about the chat, uh, I think uh, Ryan, you posed a lot of really interesting questions. One of them I think is really like, how to use NTA to get more insight into topics related like to inequality. And I think also I had a, uh, there was a, uh, a seminar about two weeks ago by Agnes Keaton also about uh, talking about the COVID and the unequal kind of really number of deaths among different groups now uh, also in the US and I think it's also not clear and uh, I have just two immediate feedbacks. One feedback would be possibly uh, we don't only have to look I think at the specific age group where we are interested in the health issue but in fact NTA might help us also to have this life cycle kind of impact of health because we are also measuring younger age groups and part of it might really be related to younger age groups and then uh, playing the game out over your life cycle that in the end you are disadvantaged at a specific age. The other thing I was wondering and I think Hippolyte might uh, say something to this, we had often this discussion by doing NTA by education or other socioeconomic status variables because we don't have the aggregate controls anymore for many of the kind of subcategories, which might be a difficult thing here. But these are just two quick immediate reactions and I'll give over now maybe to Agnieszka if there's anything in the chat room or... No, then I just look at uh, your faces and uh, whether anyone wants to ask something, raise the hand to start the discussion on this topic. Yeah, Ron? Well, uh, I should say one of the there was a change in the US at the National Institutes of Health which had funded NTA for 30 years or something, 20 years, uh, and they suddenly changed their policy so they'd only support research which had health as the primary outcome that people were looking at. So there was a lot of pressure for NTA <laughs> in the US to start to find health relevant projects and uh, that led to this project that Ryan was uh, describing. But more generally, uh, so Ryan talked particularly about um, health insurance as a transfer, uh, which is very important. But there's also just the broader question about transfers in general and the health as an outcome. And we've seen uh, work by uh, Tobias and Fanny on uh, the reunification of Germany and, and the consequent increase in pensions that old people in East Germany received, which seems to um, 
lead to a more favorable, I guess, a catch up in life expectancy or something like that. Uh, and uh, Tobias and Fanny and I have been working on a paper um, on, well, more general health outcomes in association with uh, transfers using NTA data and life expectancy and doing international comparisons. I don't know if Tobias and Fanny are in this chat, or this uh, meeting or not. But uh, so there are many uh, kinds of possibilities. Um, uh, and well, I'm, I'm very interested to see these explored further, uh, both because it's substantively relevant and because it's important for the US for us to get NIH funding again. <laughs> Many thanks. I just saw Agnetzke. There was some highlight in the chat. Is there some news in it? Uh, yes, uh, it, it's a comment that it would be great to get uh, long term care broken out from healthcare in the NTAs. And Gretchen agreed on that. And I think it's a very good idea because with population aging, we see more and more long term care issues. And there's huge, there are huge differences in how countries deal with long-term care financing and long-term long care uh, sort of split between um, families and public expenditure. So I think it's, it's really a, a very good point. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left. Are there any comments on this or suggestions how to proceed? Well, I just <clears throat> wanted to mention one project that, <clears throat> excuse me, is on my to-do list for um, the U.S. Uh, time transfer accounts and NTA is uh, trying to connect. So there's literature showing that staffing in nursing homes in certain times affected mortality rates uh, overall for older persons just because so many of them were in nursing homes. And when uh, the economy was good, nursing home jobs went begging because they're not very good jobs and that staffing problems possibly contributed to higher death rates at nursing homes, um, which of course is now quite relevant for uh, the COVID-19 era as uh, nursing homes, uh, care homes play such a big role uh, in mortality. <clears throat> but in trying to figure out if the same dynamics were um, at play in unpaid care work. So, when times are good, are people doing more uh, paid labor so that there's less time for that family, unpaid family care? And is that also possibly contributing to mortality? And I was going to try to, it's a sort of a micro distributional NTA issue because I was going to try to do sort of state level um, NTAs. And I mean, of course it would have to be aggregated over larger, uh, age groups and things because the cell size of surveys would get so small. But uh, so that was one idea that I had had for connecting um, health with NTA outcomes and also NTA distributional things. And if anybody was sort of interested in that kind of thing, I would be happy to share with you my uh, the work I did trying to get those ideas up for the U.S. I haven't done it yet, <laughs> but it's on the list. Hi, Ryan. Yes, Ryan. Sorry, I I wanted to, to advertise, uh, you know, health retirement study is not formally one of the data sets, I think, that goes into the NTA, uh, but I, I wanted to flag that Rand apparently is going to think about coding up the helpers, uh, which is this big part of the story, you know, who is helping. Um, and, and so the problem is if you wade into the weeds of that and really want to get it right, it's tremendously difficult data to work with, but apparently it's on Rand's list to do that. Um, and if, uh, if I see that they do, I'll let you know. <laughs> it's yeah, it'd be really cool to look at. I think there's a lot of interest in how this looks like, you know, at the end of life help, whether it's informal or, or it could be formally delivered through an in-home in uh, care deliverer here in the United States. And it's been changing a ton. Uh, but I, you know, I don't think there's been as much work on it as, as there should be. Okay, Minis, thanks. Uh, uh. Are there any more comments? Yeah, Ron? Um, Ryan, is Rand going to be doing that for
for all the HRS type surveys for Cher and Elsa and Charles and Tiger and all the countries? That's a really good question. I, I'm unaware of what they may have done for Cher. Um, so we probably need to send an email to Mike Hurd or something and uh, one of the people down there in that group and, and see what they you know, have thought about. Uh, maybe it's the USC group with Eileen Crimmins too, I don't know. Uh, I guess it would be wonderful if it would be done for Cher as well or Elsa, I think. I mean, this would be great to have a comparison because the European system is very different to the US system, of course. And I think this would be really interesting, I guess. Uh, is there anything, Agnetska, from the chat or something? Yeah. Agnetska, or? Yes, I mean, not from the chat, but I just. Uh, a little side point, but it might be interesting with share because right now we of course needed to suspend the field work for wave eight that was currently done. But at the same time, there's a special questionnaire that is developed to follow the COVID development, including the issues of how older people were cared for during this time and this will be done this summer. So in the autumn we, we may have interesting data that could also to the discussion on how the uh, care provision was provided to people 50 plus during the, the, the COVID times. Okay. Uh... If there are no further comments or questions, I'm wondering because uh, as the next point I would have before we go to the presentation by Julian, it would be Louis asks about SES disaggregated NTA estimates. I'm not sure if he's here or not. Uh, Gretchen, do you know? He's not here. No, okay. <laughs> then we have maybe two more minutes before we go to the presentation. Uh, I mean, just one point I would like to raise. We have a huge problem, of course, in many European countries in NTA. We don't have those people, of course, included who are in the elderly care homes. I mean, we won't have any NTA really data, except, of course, the public investment, everything, but no private kind of like consumption or whatever, which would be excluded in the NTA only estimates. I think and we had a lot of problems. I think it would be interesting to talk to Tommy because Sweden had a very different profile to many other countries and it's partly also, I think, uh, caused by how they have uh, really calculated everything. But generally, I agree with Agnetska. I think nowadays it's very interesting. There are already the first studies arguing that eight weeks of being closed and no relatives can visit the elderly care home might have a really strong effect on more also for the elderly in times of really stress, etc. So I think this is also something, I guess, which maybe Cher will take up, I think, also. And I'm sure David can tell a lot about the English experience at the moment in these elderly care homes. <laughs> okay, so do I see any hands raised or not? Ryan, do you want to give a kind of concluding remark what you would like to propose? I think the idea of these meetings is really, I mean, whether uh, we can establish maybe some smaller groups who would be interested in a topic and to meet and uh, continue on this. Yeah, well, I, th I just uh, want to say thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to see everybody again and talk about these topics. The, you know, what Gretchen remarked about with long-term care, it, it just, it's, sparked something in my head because the last year I've been working on uh, Alzheimer's and related dementias uh, and this is an issue. It, it's clear that more good work could be done in this area um, and yeah I, I just can never stop saying that the health retirement study is a great thing to work with. Uh, in particular though the time transfers I think might be really cool. Uh, maybe I yeah uh, sorry Agnieszka. <laughs> Just wanted to highlight that Andy uh, posted a message that uh, it's easy to add long-term care to the NTA database. It would be it would be more likely to be successful if a working group want to develop a comparative project that would use the data. So I think it goes back to, to Gretchen uh, idea to, to to develop a working group that works on the LTC and definitely we in Poland would be very interested in, in pursuing this work. 
That's the fourth group that we had <laughs> to come yeah. out of uh, the meeting. So. It's a very fruitful workshop. I, I, I so guess the difficult, yeah, the difficult thing would be to really have names to each working group leading the working groups. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, just to be sure that we won't miss Julian because he has only time, I think, for another 45 minutes. I would like to pass on now, I think, to start with the presentation. And I think we're getting in a very interesting topics now. Uh, but Julian, to really understand how to use NTA now by immigration status. And uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. And uh, so possibly you can share the slides with us and then we have a discussion. Yes, I will. Hi. By Gretchen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alexia. So hi, everyone. Sorry to be late for, for my presentation. But I'm on time for my presentation, so it's OK. Um, I'm just trying to share my do you see my presentation now? Okay, that's great. So I will introduce the fifth group of the day, talking about <laughs> immigration. So today my paper called Impact of Immigration on uh, Net Public Transfers in Canada, a National Transfer Account Approach. So those are preliminary results. And I want to say that uh, I benefited a lot from uh, Ippoli's remarks about, uh, about, uh, about immigration, because it's one of the of the, of the, the specialist uh, on immigration, especially for France. So this is a paper uh, we started with our colleagues from uh, University, University of Ottawa and uh, University of Montreal. And those are preliminary results. So don't hesitate to, to make me remarks. I'm really, really, uh, I will be really happy to have um, some of, of your remarks. So, oh, sorry. So I just start really quickly by the Canadian literature who tries to make uh, uh, to compare contribution and public transfer received by immigrants uh, on one side and sometimes for native on the other side. So we had a really old paper by Akbari in 1989. So it's, it was a bit old, but they, they, they con concluded that uh, uh, immigrants had a net positive contribution uh, by $500 uh, uh, to the public transfer system. And more recently, a really controversial paper by Grubel and Grady, who focused on, on recent immigrants, uh, concluded on a, on a net cost, let's say, of $6,000. And, and one of the main articles in the Canadian literature about immigration is this one. Shabdani and Pendakur who, who say that, uh, who, who concluded on a, 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 a net cost per capita uh, by, uh, by $500. Okay. So, what's our, what was our first idea uh, in this paper? Uh, so, at the beginning we were thinking, and you will see it's not the case, that immigrants should contribute more than native, because in Canada they are more educated than, uh, than Canadian born. So, 74% of, of, uh, of immigrants have uh, post-secondary education in comparison to 59% for Canadian born. I'm just checking the conversation because maybe I'm not, okay, no, sorry. <laughs> it's just about something else. Um, and as you know, as in every country, uh, uh, immigrants are particularly represented in, in the working age group and they are doing pretty well in terms of, of unemployment and participation rates in comparison with other developed countries. So yeah, we were thinking, they might have a positive impact on, to, on the public transfer system. So how, how did we do that? Uh, so basically, Polit, we did exactly as we did for NTA by uh, gender status. So we assume that we have those aggregates by age from the regular national transfer accounts. So at each age, we have those uh, public transfer aggregates. And we want to allocate each age between immigrants and native. It's very basic. Um, we needed population by age for immigrants at each age, uh, and we got it from 1981 to 2016. Um, and we just obtained, obtained them a few months ago. And, and also, as you know, per capita age profile, we will not go on, on every, uh, every public transfers, but uh, basically we have all the cash transfers, pension, public pension, uh, family allowances, and so on uh, from uh, from uh, uh, one of the survey and also all the outflows so let's say the taxes from from surveys 
And one of the big, big issue is about administrative data. So for education, we use the number of students by age from the census because we have the immigration status in the census. For health, it's much more complicated and, and we are not, we're not happy about what we did. We, we only have the number of visits to hospitals, family doctors and specialists. So we have to improve it because as there might be some bias about, about what immigrants and native consume when they consume health uh, expenditure. And for the public consumption, we assume that, as always, each individual gets the same. So what, uh, what is the, the first, uh, the first uh, 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 big result uh, of our article? So those are uh, aggregate public transfer uh, in 2015. Last year, we have uh, all age group together. And as you can see in red uh, for net public transfers, uh, whereas native uh, have a net contribution of seven billion dollars uh, for this year, immigrants have a net, let's say, cost of uh, twenty billion Canadian dollars. So basically, the, the, the negative uh, uh, amounts of public transfers uh, that we have for World Canada is explained by immigrants and. Uh, as you can see in the, in the other red uh, square, uh, whereas immigrants represent one fourth of the population, they get more than one fourth of public transfer inflow and they make less than one fourth of, of the public transfer inflow. So this is a big picture for 2015. And something I didn't tell you, we, 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 did, we did this calculation in Canada because we have a lot of immigrants and we have one four of the population that that are immigrants so that's why we could use the survey to distinguish between uh, immigrants and native even if we have some bias uh, regarding the fact that a lot of immigrants are in toronto on average it might work so when we look at per capita age profile of public transfer for uh, immigrants versus natives uh, we have something like that so on the top those are what you really, really want to know, public transfer inflows. And we compare in red immigrant with natives in the blue. And as you can see for inflows, it's pretty similar when we look at per capita uh, public transfer. We might have some differences, especially after 60 years old, explained mainly by public pensions that uh, are higher for natives. But otherwise, there is no big, big difference. The big difference is due to public transfer outflows. So on the bottom of this graph, as you can see, uh, at each age, native more than, uh, than, uh, than immigrants per capita. So you, you, you might ask uh, why we have this uh, difference between immigrant and native at young ages. This is due to uh, uh, added value taxes, so tax and consumption. So those are for, for the uh, per capita age profile. So, and what, what, what is this graph? It's uh, between 1997 and 2015. So we did, did calculation for each year, each of those years. Um, we have on one side net public transfer per capita for immigrants in red and in blue, the same for natives. And we compared our result for immigrants with a uh, Jabdanian Pendako who did, who did this exercise. It was not an NTA exercise, a comparative for 2016. So two major results. First, for natives, uh, we have, after 2000 and, uh, 2007, positive contribution of native, and it's, improve, it's improving over time. With the COVID-19 crisis, I, I'm sure it will change. But, uh, and for immigrants, some things that seems to deteriorate over time. So it's positive, it means that they cost more then they contribute to the public transfer system and it seems to be to 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 deteriorate deteriorate sorry especially after the 2008 crisis which is surprising we have on one side native where we contribute more and more and immigrants seems to be more costly so it's something we have to investigate uh, especially on the labor market so this graph it, it's not the best idea that i 
I, I just did it on Excel. <laughs> I'm sure it's not the perfect solution. We have really, really useful stuff from R and I will improve <laughs> it uh, um, after. So what is that? It's uh, so between zero and 90 years old from 1997 to 2015. It's a ratio of per capita public transfer outflows. So I focus on the outflows because as I told you, I think that the problem comes from outflows um, of native at each age divided by per capita public transfer outflow of immigrants at age eight. So what appears to be a really dark blue at 12 years old is actually at 17 years old. So uh, uh, it's, it's a problem of my graph. My graph is not good. Um, and as you can see for young ages, uh, we go from, from the light blue, so a ratio between 1.2 and 1.4 to a ratio between 1.4 and 1.6. So that means that young workers uh, uh, for native contribute more and more in comparison with immigrants. And we have the same after, let's say, 50 years old. Uh, 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 as you can see, we go from, from the, I don't know if it's orange or red, to light blue and, and maybe sometimes dark blue. So it means that this age group, uh, uh, this age group uh, uh, has also some uh, issues uh, over time about public transfers. So we would just focus. So it's where we, we it's where we, uh, uh, we just stopped like a, a few days ago. It's where we are right now. And um, so we realized it was because of public transfer outflow. So basically, the main, the main, uh, it's it's mainly driven by labor income. So. What we did is we, we, we calculated also labor income uh, between 1981 to 2015. We were able to do it on a longer period of time. And this is really surprising because on the left, for native, it's really basic. So those are, I'm sorry, those are um, uh, um, a birth court uh, per capita uh, um, um, uh, uh, lines over time, sorry. Uh, and if you compare one generation to another at each age, you can see that with growth, uh, native uh, uh, increase their the LIBOR income they generate and they receive. However, for immigrants, it's really different over this period of more than, uh, it's around 35 years, if I'm correct, yeah, LIBOR income almost stagnated. So, so it's, it's one of the most driver of our result in our opinion uh, when we, we talk about uh, public transfer outflow. Uh, so it's where exactly where we stopped, uh, where, where we realized that. Uh, so, so what are the next steps uh, for this? It's pretty preliminary. We have to improve our distribution keys, uh, especially for health expenditure. We only use a number of visits to specialists and family doctors, and it's not enough. I mean, if you are an immigrant, and uh, 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 recent immigrants, maybe you will not uh, go um, uh, as always as native to, uh, to, to the doctor uh, to get some, uh, some particular, uh, uh, I don't find my words, uh, expenditure. So what I want to say is that maybe <coughs> immigrants are less costly than, than, uh, than native for one visit. Uh, explain more precisely why labor income and this contribution stagnated, stagnated over the last 40 years. Immigrants are more well, are, are more educated than, than natives, but it seems that they suffer from either uh, uh, discrimination or at least a problem of, of recognition of, of uh, the education um, education uh, uh, degrees. It's particular. It's really well known, for instance, in Ottawa, that we have a lot of really really educated immigrants from from Iran. They are doctors in many fields, and they drive Uber. So it's, it's one of, of, of the biggest problems for many immigrants from, from the Middle East, uh, which is not the case for immigrants from Europe, for instance. Uh, and we have to explicit our hypothesis in comparison with previous studies. We have to exactly explain what's different and what we did in comparison with uh, the previous studies. And I think that's it. So. Great, um, Alexia. Yes, many thanks. That's perfect. And now I pass over to Gretchen, who will start with a discussion. Hi, um, <clears throat> Julianne, thank you very much. And I was excited to be the discussant for this because I actually kind of know something about this topic, <laughs> as opposed to many things in NTA that go right over my head. Um, 
so uh, as Ron put in the chat, um, he uh, and Tim Miller did a sort of the work on uh, starting this up for the United States, figuring out uh, different age profiles for immigrants. And, and then I was involved in updating that. And um, there were certainly very different dynamics, but I just did want to, and I put the uh, URL for that uh, volume. And if you haven't looked at that, um, not just to sort of uh, say, you should go read my stuff. What is really helpful in that volume, I think is one chapter that really reviews all the different accounting frameworks for uh, how you can try to, first of all, think about um, the difference between immigrants and uh, natives and also the just sort of what a fiscal impact is and that it really depends on how you frame that question and sort of what your counterfactual is or your thought experiment. Um, you can get completely different sort of calculations and, and, and really different um, answers. So I would recommend that overview chapter, which I didn't write, somebody else. Uh, um, did so, but it's it's a really good um, review. Um, the idea, and as you mentioned at the end, I mean, so looking at the labor income profiles, the first idea that came to mind was this kind of like um, issue of sort of credential devaluing. You know, when you go from one um, place to another, and whether that is sort of legitimately differentiating on those credentials, they're actually not as good as a comparative similar credential for native, um, or whether it's an issue of kind of discrimination or just sort of administrative kind of, it's impossible to get certified again. You know, that I think that it, it is really good to highlight those issues because they help, they get to something that I think NTA is very good at highlighting and that in the gender accounts we try to highlight a lot, is that um, is showing sort of inefficiencies in if we're discriminating against different groups for some reason that isn't directly germane to say productivity, um, then NTA, broken out NTA age profiles give us a way to sort of quantify how much is lost in that system. So, you know, when you educate girls and boys similarly, and then you say, however, girls have to do this kind of labor and boys have to do this kind of labor, we can use our gender separated profiles to sort of estimate the loss that um, from that. Uh, and I think the same kind of thing here is that, you know, if you have an immigration policy that is about letting in sort of the most highly educated, the most sort of, um, you know, potentially productive immigrants. And then for other reasons, you actually don't end up using those people as productively as you could. There's a sort of inefficiency in that policy that I think um, our estimates can be used to really pinpoint and to show the missing piece in that policy that, you know, okay, so you Need, you're letting these people into the country, but if we don't address other potential barriers to their full um, integration into our labor market, this is what we've let. This is what we've lost. You know, so I think that's potentially um, a really useful message from these kinds of subgroup um, estimates. And and then there are a lot of questions about. Um, how public goods are being calculated in here. Um, but again, that's a, a big sort of conceptual issue about, you know, do our immigrants costing a share of all of these other public, you know, the CGX, the other public profile? Because there's a lot of, uh, it depends on what the counterfactual is that you're talking about. Are you talking about changing a program to reduce sort of the quotas? Then you're you're in kind of a marginal impacts, you know, thing. And so if you're talking about reducing a quota, then these public good costs are not gonna change. If you're talking about, uh, you know, ending immigration altogether, then maybe they would. But it's, um, I think that is, an example of how important it is to really specify, get the question right and really specific to drive what is going to be included in the calculation pieces. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, and then there's also the issue of what the second generation kids are. 
Um, so in the US, there are children who are native born citizens of newly arrived immigrants. So where do I calculate? Where do I put them? Who, what bin do they go in? And in the work that we did um, a couple years ago for that National Academy volume, we had a few different uh, ways to think about it. Um, but again, there is sort of like, what's the counterfactual? Are we talking about ending, you know, in the US like birthright citizenship? Then that's gonna drive including those second generation kids in a different way. Um, trying to see if I've gotten all of my points. Yeah, I think that's mainly what I wanted to say, but um, I think this is a, a, great, uh, a great sort of continuation of this legacy that Ron and Tim started way back when of breaking these things out so that we can understand those flows, but then uh, you do have to be really careful about explaining um, what the research question is. So, okay. uh, many thanks. Uh, I would maybe now suggest to give Julian the opportunity to immediately reply to the questions raised by Gretchen, and then I'll open the general discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Alexia. So yeah, so first, thank you to for sending me uh, as a reference. I think it will be really, really useful to our work. So about about the definition of immigration here, it's it's a basic immigration definition. It's uh, people who are born outside Canada and who are born on, as non citizen, as non Canadian citizen. Sorry. So um, we decided to start by this first uh, this first work because. We knew it was possible for us to have this uh, age for population by age for immigrants versus native qu quite easily from Statistics Canada. It will. It only took like two months, something like that. So, so it was a good first. Step. And for sure, like one of our uh, uh, main discussion is about the second generation of immigrants. And uh, uh, it's especially the case like in France. Hippolyte knows it very well. One of the main discussion about about this kind of calculation about about. Uh, uh, immigration uh, for for public transfer uh, 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 measurement, especially public consumption. Yeah, it's one of the big uh, limitation of our work. Uh, I was talking about health expenditure, and now if we talk about other kind of public transfer flow, so like we started by this this basic what is this like like we're doing for. Uh, other public transfers. I'm not sure that, for instance, I will uh, make a different assumption for police expenditure. Uh, I don't know. For sure, because I, as an immigrant in Canada, I benef my, my benefit from, from police is the same as my neighbor, okay? Because I, I benefit from, from the protection of, of police. Uh, I, 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 I am not convinced by this uh, I don't know, this, some, some people in France did that. They tried to allocate the cost regarding the number of time people were going in jail, but it's a service. In my opinion, policy is a service that you, you get to be protected. Not, uh, you don't consume police, you consume the protection by police. I don't know if I'm right, maybe it's a, it's a stupid assumption. I don't know, but um, uh, so yeah. So for, for the moment, we, we just decided to have like, uh, 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 only uh, um, uh, the, the same for immigrants and native. Some things that we want to do, it, it's a really small amount, but we would like to take into account the expenditure for uh, the, the Immigration Canada, that is the Minister of Immigration. It will be really something uh, really little, but for the big picture, it will be more serious to say, okay, look, we can as assume that the public cost of of, of, of uh, immigration are uh, rely on immigrants. But, uh, it's, it's something, I, I don't have the figures in mind, but it's a, it's a pretty small pro proportion, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if it's a good response or, or not to... Uh, yeah. no. <laughs> to <say that laughs> maybe maybe some, some people have, have, have uh, other better idea for public uh, consumption, others and else in education. I don't know. Uh, thanks so much. I think it's uh, I think it's perfect, and I already see. I think uh, maybe Agnetska, we have something in the chat already. 
before I open it for everyone. Uh, we had the discussion with Miguel in, in the chat. So uh, it started from the issue of the difference in the number of children between the nationals and the immigrants, but we also and uh, I've replied that demographic research shows that there's some adjustment to the patterns of receiving country as far as fertility patterns are, co are concerned. But then uh, we also discussed that it would be interesting to have also a migrant sending country perspective, as we have in the NTA uh, group many countries that are, are not only receiving countries but also sending countries. So for for them, they, there are also distributional consequences. Like for example, they invest in education, and then those migrant those, those people that have gone through the education sort, sort of path in in the sending country migrate out. So their their human capital actually feeds into the receiving country. So there is a lot of questions that. I think the topic opens again. Many thanks. So then I think I would open now. Uh, yes, Ron? Um, re you know, responding to some of uh, what Agnieszka was just uh, saying, uh, Ivan, who I think is unfortunately up here, uh, did a paper on just this uh, issue for Mexico of the Mexican uh, migration to the U.S. and the educational levels and so on, and, and then remittances and what the net, the net uh, effect was. So I think it is a very interesting uh, use of NTA to explore a different aspect of this migration issue. And the, uh, yeah, there are many interesting questions about fertility and mortality and how these different for differ from migrants. Uh, in the U.S. there was a process of convergence. Uh, two generations after a migrant, the fertility was the same, but the second generation had fertility that was halfway between the first and the second. But now the differences between sending countries and receiving countries are much smaller than they were when doing that work in the 1990s. To come to uh, Julian, Julian's uh, uh, paper, I think for me the most striking thing was that chart of the labor income <laughs> for immigrants. Uh, forget fiscal impact, that just all by itself is such a huge policy issue and such a surprising finding. I, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, yeah, I was surprised too. I, was, I didn't to expect me. that at all. Like some things yeah. stagnate over 35 years. It's really long, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, then the last thing I wanted to say was, uh, I think the main <clears throat> um, innovation in what uh, Tim and I did uh, when we were looking at the fiscal impact of immigration in the US was to go to a longitudinal uh, framework in which Yes, we're projecting forward for an immigrant arrives at a certain age with a certain level of education, and then we project forward the taxes they pay, the uh, benefits, the public benefits they receive at each age until they die or return to the uh, country of origin. And then we're also projecting forward their fertility in the future uh, and the education of the children based on a transition matrix from the education of the parents, the education of parent of children, and that was by country of origin. And so we have a kind of long-term dynamic process going on over generations. And then we, um, that gives us our sort of basic, uh, information and then we can take net present values of the fiscal impact or I think actually in retrospect more useful is not the net present values but looking uh, year after year after year at the accumulated effect of earlier immigration. Anyway it's a different it, it's a next step perhaps in the approach. 
Uh, that's in addition to the things Gretchen was uh, mentioning. Thank you. Uh, many thanks. Uh, we are already at the end of this session, but I would allow maybe one more question or comment if there's any. Uh, yes, you put it. Uh, just a, a short question, you know, by curiosity, but because so and this applies to, uh, to 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 Julien, but uh, maybe to other work, and uh, I don't really know them, so uh, maybe I, I miss something. But for me, the, the the big issue is that there are some immigrants that return return home, you know, in their home country when they are retiree, and then they still could get the pension, you know, if. Uh, uh, and in particular, the pension, if it's um, provided by the by some public fund, and this is a huge cost that I feel is uh, under uh, that, that cannot be captured, you know, in uh, NTA uh, accounting of immigration. So, uh, so I'm I, I, I'm I'm simply wondering, Julien, if you take this into account and what kind of study you could get, you know, in order to capture those. And, uh, and I was thinking about this uh, longitudinal stuff, you know, and you say, Ron, that you take into account, you know, the whole life cycle, um, you know, because there's a whole, the whole behavior along the life cycle, um, and you take into account that those people could return. But, uh, you know, how could you use, you know, the data we have in order to estimate, you know, those pensions, you know, that are given to people that have been returned home. And, it's a, and, and in terms of fiscal impact, you know, it's a very large cost. So, so no, we don't take them into account. It's really basic uh, definition of either you are a resident in the country or not. So, so we don't take into, into account in this exercise. Yeah. So for a country which is based on a, on, on a labor migration, you know, basically uh, people come only during their active life, uh, aren't you, you know, missing a really a large point? Uh, maybe I uh, just saw uh, a clip, yeah. No, oh, sorry. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that basically many of the immigrants uh, uh, um, who come from, for, from, from working permit for a few years, after this working permit to get a permanent uh, residence in Canada. However, it's more and more frequent to have more and more working permit, especially in Quebec. But uh, uh, I, I don't know for retrospectively, but uh, I think that a, a, a huge share of working permit uh, uh, got, got a, a, a permanent residence after, after this working permit. Yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see Agnetska and Ron maybe. Uh, Agnetska, you raised the hand and then Ron and... Uh Yes, I mean, there, there's uh, uh, another comment in the Zoom, uh, in the chat from Gretchen, uh, that, that regular old taxes might be a better indicator than the more complex NTA outflows measure. Uh, and also Tim posted a link to uh, the re National Academy uh, report the immigration debate studies on the economic, demographic, and fiscal effects of, of migration. So uh, that was it. And uh, I also had a comment uh, during the previous workshop. I mentioned administrative data and if there are uh, public transfers of pensions. So if pensions are trans transferred through the public pension systems, usually the social security agencies have information on where they send and uh, pensions and if they pay out pensions to foreigners that are residing in the country. So it might be a source of information if we would like to get those transfers somehow taken into account. Okay, many thanks, so Ron. <laughs> um, so uh, in response to Hippolyte's uh, uh, questions, so the, the U.S. analysis is done not just by age, and I don't remember whether we do by sex, but also by um, duration in the country. That is, different. Im each immigrant arrives at a particular age and then is projected forward. And we have our surveys give data by time since arrival. 
So then we know the rules. First of all, we don't have good information on documented status. But if you have undocumented immigrants, and we have, I don't know, 11, 12 million undocumented immigrants in the U.S., then they work, uh, they may stay for decades, but they're not going to qualify for the public pension. Uh, uh, but, uh, and we don't, we can only deal with that more or less by assumption. Uh, but uh, if, if, say, about half of the low education workers are undocumented or something, we know the rules of qualifying for Social Security benefits. They're based on earnings and how, how long, how many years of, you know, so we can calculate all that. And then it makes no difference, really, whether they're receiving the pension in the U.S. or they've returned abroad. So they are in the, uh, they are in the accounts. That, that's the way I remember. I'm not sure exactly how that Gretchen has done all this very recently and a, a wonderful uh, detailed job. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly how she did things, but that's the way uh, we were doing it. So I think we are running out of time a little bit, but it's, it's so interesting. And I think it's like Agnieszka has mentioned, I think it's a hot topic also the other way around in many Central and Eastern European countries. We have a huge population decline because they are losing so much of the highly educated population to the West. And it would be really interesting to get some of these countries into NTA, I think, in the future uh, and about human capital and everything. So. I'm looking to Julian. I think we are creating working groups, I guess. <laughs> you would be possibly the head of such a working group. Uh, I mean, when we do NTA by immigration, I think. Uh, nothing at the moment you have to say yes immediately, but I guess it's always <laughs> good <laughs> to have someone working on this immediately. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry that I have now to uh, uh, close this session. It was excellent. It's extremely important, wonderful presentation discussions. And I would now give over, I think, for the last 25 minutes to thank you about, uh, I think, the last session about sharing micro data sets. I think actually Luis, Gretchen, and Bernard actually suggested something here, right? So they can actually speak for a couple of minutes about their ideas. Is Luis here? Uh, Luis is no. not. Oh. Okay. I, I don't think so. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, Gretchen, <laughs> you can actually start here. Yeah. Sure. Uh, it's not a very big idea, but um, I mean, so if we are all creating micro level NTA data sets in thinking one line for each individual and then there's a variable for each individual level NTA flow all adjusted to our macro controls, then uh, we have something that is sort of already harmonized, uh, thinking of international uh, IPMs, if anybody has used that, you know, they've taken census samples from all over the globe and, uh, and pulled them into one common framework. So age is coded the same for everybody and the documentation is all there and it just makes it uh, much easier to do international comparative work. And uh, of course, they've also gone to the trouble of getting permission to put all these data sets out in public. I know that many NTA teams are using our national data sets with some restrictions on how we can use them or how we can share them again once uh, we've uh, done our calculations. But um, it does seem like a tremendous opportunity to jam all of these things together and allow micro level cross country comparisons. So you can do a lot more fancy stuff um, with country fixed effects or you know uh, interactions by country um, if we can all share these big data sets that we make out of our microdata. So that was all. And uh, Bonard, you suggested something here. Bonard, here. Um, well, it I actually didn't think about it 
too deeply how to share it because I think we are very far away from being able to share micro data sets. But anyway, I just we should have a look at uh, what the Sukman and colleagues does with the distributional national accounts data set. What and maybe in the long run we can, uh, if if they share it in a successful way, I think maybe we can do something similar in the long run. And also, Luis is not here, but Luis suggested, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, like establishing a working subgroup to explore each topic with real micro data. So he suggested uh, something like uh, some subgroup for investigating the topic. So let me actually summarize. I mean, because I'm, 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 I, I, my name is here, reaction from me. Uh, so we are talking about like uh, some organizational issues here. It's very, very important, right? So we have talked about so many things today and uh, on May uh, 4. So uh, what are the advantages of uh, our data and TA is comparable, right? So, I mean, so what are the advantages of a comparative data? It's a data sharing and idea sharing. So it's good. I mean, we want to have, we, 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 that's our strengths. Actually, one of our great strengths is comparable. What are the difficulties? It should be comparable. So <laughs> we should compare banana with banana, not banana with apple. So what Luis suggested is that Okay, let's have some uh, topic. Of course, I mean, you know, it should be comparable. So, you know, uh, we have, should have some subgroups and investigate the topic. And Gretchen said, that, oh, let's have the, some data, micro data files. Yes, if you actually have some topics, then we have to construct micro data files. But uh, the micro data files is such a broad concept. So it depends on topic, what kind of a topic you have. You can create so many different micro files, right? And uh, Bernard suggested, oh, so let's have some kind of sending workshop for like, uh, uh, you know, NDA. Yes, that's the organizational issue. So because uh, uh, to be comparable, we have we face many methodological difficulties, right? Uh, so, you know, variables are measured with error and there are like, uh, you know, confidence interval problems, uh, macro control problems, and uh, we don't have many observation for some groups and uh, it, should be uh, it should be representative. So having said that, actually, what you suggest, uh, uh, Luis, Bernard, Gretchen, the answer is yes, we should do all, right? <laughs> but we should, right? So it's not a different thing. We should do all, but we should begin with uh, um, something, topics, what we are going to do, because the, dep the data set, data construction depends on what we are going to do. So I have three suggestions. One is, uh, well, we should be a little bit flexible. Uh, flexible means, uh, you know, like in 2002, 2003, when we started the NTA, the name was not NTA actually. We talk about NTA right now, but it was NTFA, National Transport Flow Accounts. And uh, we actually, in, under NTA, we have a National Transport Flow Accounts and we construct in like five years. And after that, we have a NT wealth account, right? So I probably, <laughs> Some of you remember that we have a disgrace scheme, but somehow we actually uh, say NTA, but that's actually national transfer flow accounts. So then the next step is, <laughs> so we had a disgrace scheme. It, it took us like 18 years to talk about now this uh, uh, national transfer wealth accounts and all that. So what I'm saying flexible is that, uh, you know, some people actually talk about HRS. Let's just use this, let's use this. But if I have used the HRS. I mean, I have used the, like charts and that. And that even for like harmonized HRS rent, it's not very comparable. I mean, share is comparable, right? So, so what I'm saying is that uh, we can actually start to read the something we can do doable. So, for example, uh, like uh, in the topic as well, it's also related to grant. Uh, what we are focusing on, like long, some people say longitudinal data, some people say cross-section data. Why? Because in many countries there is no longitudinal data. Then we have to think about whether we are thinking about the change of disparity or inequality, or uh, income inequality, or I mean the inequality by socioeconomic status. So when I say flexible means like this way, for example, suppose you actually construct an uh, NTA by socioeconomic status. Then 
uh, probably we don't have to do it by what, using just one year. If we don't want to compare across years, because I don't think actually inequality change much in, within five years or three years, then you can actually use five-year-old five-year survey data and merge the five-year data and uh, you know uh, construct the NTA by socioeconomic status to you know then you have a larger larger observation. This is actually what uh, Andy and actually Michael and Gretchen did something for Hawaii. So you don't have many observations, but you want to do it for like a regional NTA, then you can actually use some, you know, like multiple year data. But uh, the question is the grant actually. The grant is that uh, what we are focusing on is uh, whether this is a research oriented or, I mean, we want both, but also policy relevant because uh, uh, someone actually mentioned about policy relevant and uh, what we want. Uh, can you actually do something like, um, you know, just use some buzzword like uh, disparity inequality? Then we talked about like healthcare, or, you know, there is a long term healthcare issues. Then all these topics, healthcare and uh, socioeconomic status, or the change of inequality and everything like uh, in, uh, within inequality, or uh, everything can be, uh, you know, can belong to this umbrella, like uh, under the name of this disparity or inequality. And this is, would be very interesting for like some funders because uh, especially after COVID-19, the issues about inequality or disparity will be really, really great. So what I'm saying is that some people focus on longitudinal data issues. Some people focus on the change of inequality or capital account, but whether these all topics can be, you know, mingled, can be written under one proposal for grant, the proposal is like addressing inequality. And under inequality, it can be a change of inequality. It can be with, you know, intra-household transfer. So something like that, that's actually, a, a, you know, just one idea whether, because otherwise, uh, you know, if you write uh, something like, oh, let's construct, uh, you know, a wealth account, uh, how many countries can do that? Like, let's see the change of, uh, you know, wealth accounts over the last 20, 30 years. I think only three countries, maybe, maybe three, four countries can do it. Uh, another issue is that in many, I mean, whether we actually include all countries, many countries, including Asia or uh, African countries or not, they don't have many longitudinal data, say, except for Taiwan or Japan. So the question is, uh, I mean, like I said, uh, if we want to do, we should start to read the, the topic first, but the topic is so, so diverse right now. So can we actually write uh, one single, I mean, can we do this one at a, like an NTA, I mean, across the all NTA, I mean, not all, all but many countries, which include uh, both cross-section and longitudinal data, and also policy relevant, because uh, we haven't talked about much policies, but whenever I meet some people, actually policymakers, and uh, explain NTA, they say, oh, do you, do have, do you have like an uh, NTA by income level? So there are many issues, right? Because we don't have much, I mean, we don't have a very big data sets. Then can you uh, work on these kind of things? Uh, uh, and health care disparity is a, is a big thing. So again, some people probably want to do it, but this is also belongs to our, the, the, our umbrella buzzword, like, uh, you know, inequality issues, right? So anyway, that's uh, all, 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 all I want to say is, uh, any Many questions? thanks. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I think we still have 10 minutes left, so we should take this opportunity to give some feedback on your questions raised. Uh, and is there anything from the chat, Agnieszka, which you would like to put in in the beginning? Or no? Okay. Then it's open. <laughs> Who would like to say something? That's why uh, no one speaks. I mean, should I give over maybe to Ron and Andy for some general conclusions or? <laughs>
Right. <laughs> Alexi, <laughs> suggestions uh, that we move on and 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 I wasn't sure I caught that right. Yeah, I was just like thinking. I mean, uh, since there are no questions, remarks, comments, I was thinking whether you and uh, Andy would like and Gretchen to give some general conclusion. Uh, Andy, would you like to say something? Uh, let me just say that uh, the uh, global MTA meeting uh, is coming up. Uh, I hope you will register if you have not. Uh, I hope you will submit papers uh, that can be uh, gathered together in great uh, Zoom sessions for which this has been kind of a trial run for us. Uh, I hope we can organize some of these working groups and use uh, August as an opportunity to follow up on some of these ideas. Uh, and it's been great seeing all of you and I, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, let me just add to that. Um, I think, I don't know what the experience of other people was, but I have found these two meetings extremely stimulating and, and valuable. Uh, the first one, more on the model of a, oh, a more conventional workshop with less or, or meeting with, with less uh, discussion and interaction, perhaps more structured. But this one, I think, showing the possibilities of really having a pretty open discussion, even in this kind of uh, Zoom uh, circumstance. So I'm, I've been very uh, pleased and uh, uh, really enjoyed it a lot and learned a lot. And uh, I'm looking forward to our big meeting in, in August. But I also encourage everybody to think of just organizing their own, you know, you have a topic, you have something you want to talk about, why not organize a little meeting of your own and send out an invitation? It, Zoom makes it so easy and our network is so wonderful and there's so many exciting topics. It'd be nice to keep talking regularly. Oh, okay. Thank you. Bye, I guess. Okay. <laughs> and I guess a big thanks to Gretchen who uh, really helped also to organize everything and set it up in such a smooth way. And I think the deadline for the global NTA is this Friday, if I have it correctly in my calendar. <laughs> yeah, and I just wanted to add um, to what Ron was saying is that very briefly, I didn't know anything about Zoom or sort of making all the stuff work. So if anybody, I mean, if you're going to be a workshop leader and want to do these meetings and need any help with just getting up to speed with the settings and the recordings and all that hooty ha, I'm happy to uh, help anybody out with that. Um, and uh, I also encourage everybody to think about um, what kinds of other sessions you'd be interested in at, um, NTA 13. You know, this Zoom makes it easy to meet and the only limiting factor is the amount of attention that we have to pay and how long I can spend with these things on my head. And um, so just as we were talking just now, I would like to um, have a meeting during NTA 13 that is uh, to sort of ask a whole bunch of country teams to come on and not the usual suspects like me um, to talk about sort of what their country specific research agenda is. So what do you want to do with NTA? What are the policymakers in your country wanting to know from you um, just to sort of broaden the scope of uh, what we're all thinking about because I know it varies tremendously from country to country and region to region. So that's one idea that I'm going to put forward for a session in NTA 13 
And I really encourage everybody else um, to send us uh, ideas about other sessions that we could have, because you know this is uh, an opportunity to break out of of a traditional mold that we've set up that was really successful, but now we can um, get creative and do a lot of different stuff and maybe some good things will come out of that. And if you have not uh, submitted your I mean, uh, abstract or if you didn't register, please do it. The deadline is May 15, okay? Form deadline, <laughs> form. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Super firm. <laughs> Oh, goodbye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks. Bye. 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 Great to you. see you all. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.